Congrats on being a new PragerU presenter. It's been a long time in the making. All of the staff here and all of our viewers are super excited about your latest video. Of course, aptly named, Facts Don't Care About Your Feelings. Can you give everyone a quick overview of, of the gist of your PragerU video? Sure. So the basic idea is that on campus, facts uh, are no longer in vogue. Feelings are all that matters. And there's been this, this theory of intersectionality that has taken over on campuses that basically suggests that you deserve to be treated as though you're telling the truth or as though uh, you are saying something virtuous simply by dint of your identity. So hmm. they have this hierarchy that goes something like this. Gay, black, Hispanic, woman, Asian, Jew, white guy. And if you are at the very bottom of that hierarchy, then you can't argue with somebody who's above you in the hierarchy because that would mean that you're victimizing them in some way. And this sort of mentality has, has been promulgated on campuses across America. It's shut down political debate. And it means that people are now treated as though they're aggressors when they're just expressing an opposing point of view. So uh, it's really dangerous. It's, it's a big problem on campuses. This is why you're seeing riots on some of these campuses, yeah. which I've experienced personally in some of these areas. Uh, and that's what the video is about. Do you think, what do you think is the greatest problem that colleges face today? I think two things. I mean, the administrators who are just cowardly and refuse to stand up to students who want to shut down free speech. And then, of course, this kind of wild coterie of students who want to shut down free speech on the basis that it offends them. And, and that really isn't most of the students. I think most students on campus are sort of politically apathetic. Hmm. Uh, even a lot of the folks who are liberal are not interested in necessarily shutting down debate. Like a lot of college Democrats aren't necessarily interested in that. But there are these new hard left groups, including people like Antifa, who will violently attempt to shut down yeah. any sort of opposing viewpoint if it appears on campus. And that's very scary and an administration that won't stand up and suspend or expel people who participate in violence in order to shut down free speech is an administration that is complicit in the rise of fascism on campus. So I know free speech is an issue that you obviously uh, care about a lot. Kim Strassel or Kimberly Strassel from the Wall Street Journal actually was our lunch keynote at our PragerU summit over the weekend and if people want access to her speech they should definitely check out PragerU.com because then they can sign up for and uh, give a donation and, and receive it and show her entire speech was on the importance of free speech but the only only thing that I think Dennis didn't ask her about in the really good Q&A that they did that I want to ask you about today is how do we then make college students understand, like, is it possible to teach them what the First Amendment is really all about and what free speech is really all about? Yeah, I, I do think that it's possible to teach a lot of these students because a lot of young people have a very basic libertarian streak, which hmm. says, leave me alone. And if you say to them, listen, leave me alone applies to me saying stuff also. You don't like it, go away. I think that a lot of people resonate to that. There is a backlash that's building on campus, and I don't want to pretend like it's every campus that's attempting to shut down speech or every student who's engaged in this. Uh, I think it's a growing minority, but I think that, that there is a backlash that is going to occur here because there still is a, a root-level resistance to uh, to this, this sort of ideological fascism that says that we can't even speak to each other, especially when the people who are being protested, it's not only people like Milo Yiannopoulos and Ann Coulter, when it's people like me or Christina Hoff Summers or Jason Riley or mm -hmm. Charles Murray, I mean, it, it, Condoleezza Rice, you know, Betsy DeVos, when it's coming to the point where people who are you know, mainstream conservatives who are not spending their days just throwing firebombs are being banned from campus because of threat of violence, I think even people on the mainstream left are beginning to say this is too much. But do you think it gets so much more attention because most of the schools that are in that minority of, you know, having issues with free speech are the really powerful schools like those in the uh, UC well, system or Ivy Leagues? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on, on the schools. I think that they, they do get a little bit of outsized attention. I speak on 25 to 30 campuses a year. Mm -hmm. I'd say 20, if it's 30, then 23, 24 of them are fine. Maybe six or seven a year mm -hmm. uh, are really bad. That's not a great ratio, but it's, but you know, still, I think the vast majority of campuses are places where I can speak without real fear of, of being hit in the face. Uh, it, it should make the headlines, and I hope that it does make the headlines, because, again, I think the reaction from both sides is pretty obvious. I mean, even Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren were saying Ann Coulter should have been allowed to speak at Berkeley. Yeah, and the ACLU. I mean, never thought yep. I'd see them come to her, her defense. So um, could you name a person that you don't think has seen the video yet that you would hope would watch this video, maybe from the left side of the aisle? Well, I mean, I, I think that the people who need to see the video are going to be people who don't watch it, typically. <laughs> you know, no, all but the I folks mean, like, is there, is there, you know, the Young Turks, Rosie O'Donnell, Chelsea Clinton? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there there are some, uh, Howard Dean, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think there, there are some people on the left who are promulgating, that they're complicit in promulgating this idea that, that ideas spoken freely are dangerous. And they need to be taught that this is a really dangerous notion, that, that fascism doesn't start with jackboots. It starts with smiley faces, and we're going to protect your feelings from other people who are bad, and all we have to do is shut them down. So, yeah, I, I think that you know some, some of those people, Young Turks, I think, would be on that list. But, but yes, I, I think that 
Uh, Howard Dean is, is top of mind just because he's actually come out and said that hate speech is not protected under the First Amendment, which is idiotic because basically what he's saying there is anything Howard Dean doesn't like isn't protected under the First Amendment, which is crazy. So one of the things that struck me the most when you talk about leftists say, you know, that to them, the First Amendment protects their right to punch a Nazi, but then they go around and they call people like you and I Nazis. So then if they happen upon us on the street one day, I guess that means that we're okay to punch. And it was just a small snippet at the beginning of your video, which people, of course, can go watch on PragerU.com right now and also find it on our Facebook page. Could you delve into that notion a little bit more, though? Because I think it's something that we're seeing uh, in society uh, especially on social media, yeah. that, that conservatives, instead of actually having a constructive debate or an argument maybe with somebody on the other side of the aisle, even a friend or a family member, you just automatically get labeled something and then it's end of discussion. I mean, the rhetoric is so polarized at this point. It has been for several years. The, the book that I wrote that was the New York Times bestseller, Bullies, was basically about this, how the left is interested in shutting down debate by making basic character arguments. You're a racist, sexist, bigot homophobe who's in league with Hitler, and therefore we should be able to hit you. You know, they, they've been building up that, that idea that everyone's a racist on the right for quite a while. There's another story this week in which they attempted to proclaim that Trump voters really voted for Trump not because they were poor and white, but because they were racist and white. Mm -hmm. uh, that, of course, is not supported by any real social science data. But the, the idea that we're all racist and therefore it's okay to punch us because it's okay to punch a racist that two-step is really, really dangerous, and it's the end of political discussion, because the fact is you can't have a conversation with someone who's calling you a Nazi. Mm -hmm. now, you can have a conversation with someone who has an honest political disagreement. You can't argue with somebody who you believe to be evil, because the proper solution to evil is not to have uh, a, a reasoned disagreement. It's to disengage or to, or to fight it, and, and I think the left, by labeling everybody on the right evil, has given itself the leeway to be able to justify violence against people on the right. In your video for PragerU, you also mentioned American privilege, because obviously people on the left and social justice warriors like to talk about how you, of course, are the most privileged of them all because you were born an American white male. Uh, can you delve into uh, American privilege a little bit? So there are certain privileges that people are born into. Being born in America is a massive privilege. It's mm -hmm. better to be born in America than to be born in Zimbabwe. And this is obvious to anyone on planet Earth, which is why everybody wants to come here. But that is because a lot of people in the United States have made very good decisions about how the United States ought to be based on freedom and liberty. Mm -hmm. That is a privilege that you experience as an American citizen. Other privileges include being born into a two-parent household. If you're born into a, a, a household with a mom and dad, then the chances that you're going to succeed in life are, are much better than if you're born into the, the house of a single mother. Not because single mothers are terrible, but because a kid needs a mom and a dad, and you need somebody earning, you need someone taking care of the kids, and you need either both parents doing both, or one parent doing one, one parent doing the other. So it's the, these sort bottom line is, I've, I've said more broadly than American privilege, decision privilege, that mm -hmm. decisions people make in their lives have natural and obvious consequences. And that's important to mention because when people say privilege, what they usually mean is something you can't change about yourself that makes you more likely to succeed. Um, but all of these things you're able to overcome. So if you not, are not born in America and you immigrate to America, then now you are privy to American privilege. If you were born in a house where you had a single mom, that's a, you, you are starting behind the eight ball, no question. But there's no question that you can also make decisions that allow you to prevail anyway. I mean, there have been uh, several presidents now who have been born uh, who, who are basically the, the children of single mothers. I mean, Ronald Reagan's dad died when he was really young. Uh, Barack Obama's father obviously was completely absent from the picture, mm -hmm. and his mom was largely absent as well. N being born in a bad situation, Bill Clinton was the was essentially a single was the mother of uh, the the child of a single mother. The the idea that if you are born in a bad situation, that's where you end up. That is a mistake, and American privilege fights that because it says you're free, and your real privilege is that you get to make decisions that have consequences. So that's scary because it means your decisions have consequences, but it's also <laughs> empowering in the sense that now you get to live with the consequences of your good decisions. I think that's one of the reasons, like you said, you talked about all the people that want to come here. It's one of the things that makes America so great and likely for somebody to be able to you know, pick themselves up by their bootstraps is that positive decisions have positive consequences, where unfortunately in other states or other nations or in states like California, the government is so restrictive and regulatory that it really is hard to succeed because the government is, is that boot on your neck holding you back. Um, now, government interventionism definitely uh, de destroys the relationship between cause and effect, and that's terrible, not only because it, it prevents good cause from meeting good effect, but also because if people don't learn that bad decisions result in bad things, they are more likely to continue making bad decisions that mm -hmm. result in bad things. So how do we d teach those consequences on a, on a broader scale then? 
Well, I mean, I think that the life sort of teaches the consequences, but we have to not shield people from the consequences mm. of their decisions, meaning that you know, it's always good to care about people. We always want to take care of people who are in our community. We want to help people through hard times and give them a hand up. But that's not the same thing as creating a moral hazard where we are actually encouraging people to make bad decisions because we've structured government benefits in a particular way. Thomas Sowell's talked very eloquently about welfare essentially destroying the black community because it used to be the 20% of kids in 1960 in the black community were born out of wedlock, and now it's in excess of 70%. And the single greatest indicator of intergenerational poverty is single motherhood. That's because the federal government stepped in and said, look at all these poor women who have these children. Let's try and pay for them. And in the process, they incentivized a lot of men to take off and a lot of women to, to have babies out of wedlock. And that's ended really poorly for a lot of kids who are being born into single mother households. So what do you say to people like me that weren't born with your level of IQ privilege? Well, I mean, you've been able to do fine. <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, the, the fact is that I, I think that one of the beautiful things about America is we can look at people anywhere on the IQ spectrum, mm -hmm. uh, pretty much, and we can see that there are people who are wildly successful, you know, all over the IQ spectrum. There are mm -hmm. people I think are stupid and untalented who are vastly more wealthy than I am. And there are people who are taller and more handsome and they can jump better and they can shoot a basketball better and you know we all have different sets of talents that's what a free market is good for it's for allocating talents to the areas where they're best positioned to thrive that's why comparative advantage is such a wonderful thing the idea is that even if i am better at even if i were to apply myself and become the world's greatest plumber that wouldn't be the best application of my particular skill set hmm. better for me to hire somebody who might have an iq that's uh, a standard deviation below mine uh, and hire them and pay them, and that person will probably end up being richer than I will if they're able to provide goods and services to people. By the way, that's not a rip on plumbers. There's some plumbers who are way smarter than I am too. <laughs> well, Mike Rowe loves that too because as you know, a fellow PragerU presenter and a big fan of yours as well, he talks about how America is actually lacking sending people in those jobs because college has now become this end-all be-all, which is another point of your video that I really liked because you focused on a study that said there are three things that people can do that will kind of guarantee like, a, a line of success and then probably depending on how hard they hustle even more and number one was just finish high school it wasn't finish college it was yeah college high school college obviously can help decrease your your personal possibility of unemployment but finishing high school is really the key if you want to get out of poverty you have to finish high school because that's considered by most employers sort of the badge of you're employable because mm -hmm. high school has been really watered down because college has been watered down. Uh, there's this been this weird reverse effect where it used to be an actual accomplishment to finish high school, and then you know college was for the top 20 percent, and now it's everyone is supposed to go to college, which means everybody is supposed to graduate high school. So it's actually had sort of a negative impact on what high school education is, and you know that has an impact on, on whether it matters whether you graduate high school. So yeah, that's yeah that is one of the three preconditions. It's it, the, the Brookings Institute says if you if you don't want to live in permanent poverty in the United United States do three things. We already talked about two of them. Don't have babies out of wedlock and make sure you graduate high school. And the third is get a job. And the idea that it's impossible to get a job for people in the United States is just not true. We're at as close to full employment as you can have according to the normal unemployment rate. It's 4.4 percent. Most economic systems of thought suggest that's pretty close to full employment without you know government nationalization and, and redistribution of property so that's you know it's the jobs are out there it's just that there's a lot of people who are are not willing to change skill sets or believe that they deserve more pay than they actually deserve based on mm -hmm. their skill set um, but if you do those three things then you're not going to live in permanent poverty in the united states in fact the, the number of people in the united states who live in poverty by the global standard. It's like 2% of people in the United States live in poverty by the global standard. Nine out of 10 Americans live middle class or upper class lives according to global poverty standards. Another you know, point of fiction that you point out that is just mind boggling to me that people haven't learned this and they just don't let it go is the disparity between how women are paid and how men are paid. You point out that a single woman with no kids and a college education typically earns more than her male counterparts. So why do we just consistently hear this? I mean, I drive around the valley in Los, downtown Los Angeles and I see billboards on the side of the 101 saying demand equal, equal pay for equal work. Yeah, I mean, I think that the reason that you see this is because it is always more convenient to blame somebody else for your problems than it is to recognize that you actually have the freedom to make your own decisions. And that's true for every group. It's true for every person. Everyone wants to believe that society out at large is out to get them. One of the things I say on campus a lot to, to college kids is, listen, no one cares enough about you to stop you. If you think there's some grand conspiracy to prevent you from succeeding in life, that's because you have too high opinion of yourself. No one actually cares about you aside from your parents and maybe your, your girlfriend or boyfriend. And that's it. So go out and succeed and stop whining about it. And I think that that has become, unfortunately, uh, uh, something that, that people don't like to hear 
Uh, they would prefer to hear the stories about how society is victimizing them. So, mm -hmm. example, I spoke down at Ote Ranch High School in, uh, in down near San Diego. This is a couple of years ago now. And I was saying exactly this. To, uh, the student body is largely impoverished over there. Um, and a lot of them Didn't are in Didn't you offend one of the students in the crowd? I remember this from the q &A. Yeah, so, I mean, this is, so what happened is that we were talking about poverty, and I said that if, if you're living in permanent poverty in the United States and you don't have some sort of disability, um, then the chances are very good that you're not good with money. Right? Mm -hmm. and that, that if you learn good monetary skills, then you will be more likely to get out of poverty. And the principal actually walked down to the front of the room. This is right, And I had also said, by the way, that, that women were not paid less than men, that the, the wage gap is a myth. And the, the principal walked down to the front of the room and excused the students. He said, if you don't want to be here because this is too offensive, you can leave. <laughs> I was like, whoa, what did I just say that was so offensive? I don't understand. Uh, and it was just offensive. What he told me is a lot of these kids have parents who made a lot of the mistakes that they're talking about, and it offends them if you tell them about that. And I, I said to him, well, wouldn't it be good for them to, like, learn what so mistakes don't their parents the mistakes? made so that they yeah. don't make the mistakes again? But no, it's more important that we protect feelings than that we actually protect kids' futures. And that's dangerous for not just this generation, but future generations as well. Ben, uh, one last thing. We have some notes on Twitter. You have lots of fans, of course. People are just saying that they need you to slow down the speech a smidge so they can, quote unquote, absorb the, the brilliance. So. Yeah, and no, I get this a lot. And unfortunately, <laughs> that is not going to happen. I've been trying it for a while. Valium seems to do the trick for a little while. But uh -huh. it's also a controlled substance, so yeah. I would be prefer not piece. to have to drug myself up before I do these things. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, don't do it before the podcast, because even though... Don't do drugs, kids. Come on. Yeah, just don't do it. You know, this could be your brain. This is your brain on drugs. <laughs> ben, <laughs> thanks so much for your time. We won't take up any more of it. Everyone should definitely check out Ben's podcast, the Ben Shapiro podcast. It's over at Daily Wire and, of course, on iTunes. Follow him on Twitter if you're not already. He loves to uh, tweet, tweet about and the president himself. Anyway, he's our latest Prairie U presenter. Welcome to the Prairie U family, Ben, and thanks so much for your time today. Thanks. I appreciate it.